of your love for us and how you made that possible. You made it operational by coming to earth, by moving among us, by dying for us, forgiving us our sins. So we thank you that uh, you did say here is love and you manifested that to us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. And uh, got a couple questions for you. When was the last time that you decided that there was someone that you wanted to get to know? Universal, right? We all do that. Somewhere, uh, probably many times in your life, you hear about someone, you read about someone, you see someone, and you say, I'd like to get to know them. So what do you do? How do you, how do you go about that? Well, most of the time, uh, you try to set up a meeting with them, and then you start to ask questions, right? So you have this uh, list of questions in your mind. If I'm going to get to know you, I need to know about you. So, you. so that takes the form of a question. But here's where the challenge comes in. No matter how... Uh, good your questions are, your knowledge of that person that you want to get to know is not so much dependent on your questions as it is on their willingness to reveal to you a response to your question, right? So your questions are important, uh, but really your knowledge of that person depends on their reveal. How much do they want to tell you about themselves? Here's the other thing that uh, goes with that. So, th so that, so if they if they're willing to tell you a lot, you can you can learn a lot. You can get to know a person, right? But the other aspect of that is, you also learn about them by talking to other people or listening to other people who have also posed questions, who also ha have got to know them. And so the combination of your questions and their reveals to you, plus other people's questions and their reveals to them come together, and then you finally, hopefully, come to the point where you say, oh, now I know you, right? Now, isn't that just standard? And, you, and you've done that. You've, in fact, that is so common, it's like muscle memory. Um, you've probably done that so often in your life, you, don't, you just kind of th think to yourself, well, that's basic. Yeah, it is basic. But the same, uh, because it's basic, um, it, it comes from someplace. It comes from um, a God who is personal, not remote, a God who comes, uh, as we're going to sing a little bit later today, Emmanuel, God with us, and so then you ask yourself, as a lot of people have said through the years, um, first of all, the, bi the big question, is there a God? And if, if so, what is God like? Well, that depends on what kind of questions you ask, what God's willing to reveal. And then you listen to other people, what questions, what he's revealed to them. You put that together, and hopefully then you, ha you come to a knowledge of who God is. So we're going to start this morning, uh, the five Sundays in December, uh, we, we're just doing this little mini-series, and we're calling it Christmas People, because this is the second aspect of getting to know someone. Uh, you have your own knowledge of, of God as you've read the Bible, as you've prayed, but secondly, a lot of what you know about God has been dependent on other people, right? What other people have said what other people have experienced. And then you put those together and your knowledge grows. Of course, that assumes that you believe there is a God and not everybody does. But if you do, or if you're an inquirer, if you're just willing to ponder that, then this is what you come to. And so you have um, in the Bible, for instance, uh, and we're just calling this uh, the first point here, the family tree, the origin of a family tree. We all have a family tree, right? You have one, mothers, fathers, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Maybe you've written that out. Some of you have gone on uh, 
what is that, Ancestry.com or 23andMe, is that one, uh, another one, where you trace your ancestry, your DNA. Uh, how, uh, anybody done that? Have any of you done that, your DNA test? Yeah. It's very interesting, right? And you find out about your ancestors, your, your family tree. Everyone has a family tree on a human level. But we're going to look this morning at, at the family tree that comes to Jesus Christ. It's the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's the first verse in Matthew's gospel, chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 1. And then we're going to look at uh, down through verse 17 this morning. And then throughout the uh, month of December, uh, so this morning, we're look, Christmas people, we're looking the ancestors. Next week, it's the young father talking about Joseph. Uh, two weeks from today, it'll be the young mother talking about Mary. Uh, Christmas Eve Sunday, we're going to just call that the unexpected. Those are the shepherds and uh, the wise men that came to Jesus' birth. And then the last Sunday of December and of the year, we'll just call that the old and faithful. That'll be about Simeon and Anna that uh, met the baby Jesus uh, uh, the week after uh, his birth. So this morning, though, as we think about ancestors, think about, first of all, this whole notion um, that not only in, in your family, uh, whether you've done a family tree or not, um, probably none of you have any doubts that you have a family tree on a human level. You might not like it. You might not like some of the branches, but it's there. Right? And so the, the, but then the question for a lot of people is okay, that's, I can buy that on a horizontal level, but on a vertical level, is there such a thing as a family tree? Well, the question that that poses is first of all, is there anybody beyond humanity? Is there a God? And if there is a God, what's God like? Who is God? Um, I don't know if some of you remember this. This is a 50-year-old book, but it's one of the, the great perennials. Some of you remember a, a, a man named Francis Schaeffer. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Francis Schaeffer wrote this book. It's over 50 years old now, and it's got such a class. It's still a very relevant uh, book to read, but I, I've, I've, I'm so drawn by the title of this. He wrote this book uh, called He Is There and He Is Not Silent. He is there, and he is not silent. That's one of the best descriptions of Christmas. Along, uh, That's kind of a broader, um, maybe a, a definition of Emmanuel, God with us. He is there, and he is not silent. And then the subtitle, though it's very interesting, it says, does it make sense to believe in God? Big question, right? Does it make sense? And hopefully you somewhere in your life, you have asked that, or maybe you're still asking that. Does it even make sense, given everything that happens to you and to other people? How can you believe in a God? And if you do, what's God like? So that's what we want to look at this morning. So the origin of the family tree. First of all, and this is we said this last week, partially God reveals himself in what we now call the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, and then in, a, in the fullness, he reveals himself in the New Testament, Matthew to Revelation, right? So even the Bible itself moves from partial to full. Um, and it's interesting, down through history, some people have had a problem with this, and they've said, well, gee, I read the Old Testament, and the, what I learn about God there seems different than what I learn about God in the New Testament. So are there two gods? Is there a God of the Old Testament, one of the New Testament? No, Bible-believing Christians say it's one God. It's just a partial revelation and then a full revelation. But there have been people through history had a big problem with this. There was a man, one of the great um, heresies in the early church, uh, first centuries of the church, there was this man named Marcion. And Marcion had such a problem with the, with the God that re was revealed in the Old Testament, he didn't like that God. He liked the God that was revealed in the New Testament. So he came to the New Testament, uh, uh, particularly he translated Luke's gospel, which also has a genealogy, and he just cut the whole thing out because he said, 
Uh, I, don't want, I don't want to mess with that. That can't be scripture. What God says about himself in the Old Testament. So he just took a razor blade and cut it out. <laughs> so people have done that, you know, through the years. Um, so there's all kinds of efforts. But when you think about the origin of the family tree of Jesus Christ, it actually starts in Genesis, doesn't it? It starts in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where right after the uh, uh, encounter of Adam and Eve with Satan, God appears and he, he pronounces future judgment, starting with Satan. And he talks about how Satan in the future uh, uh, will, you will bruise the heel of the coming Messiah, but he will crush your head. <laughs> kind of graphic. But it's, that's, the, that's where the family tree begins, really, for, for humanity. Because, and this is always speculative, we, we don't know the answer to this, but you probably maybe have asked this question, what would have happened if Adam and Eve said no instead of yes when Satan tempted them? What would the family tree have, would there have been children? Would there have been us? Uh, where would humanity have gone? We don't know. It was, it was apparently possible they had the freedom to say yes or say no. But that's where the family tree begins. It begins in Genesis, and then it moves all through the Old Testament. It's time after time. Um, Robert uh, read to us uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. That's one of the classic uh, uh, statements of the coming Messiah, right? It was in consistent with God, what God said in Genesis chapter 3. So that prediction of the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 9. And, uh, but then you come to Matthew's gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. And if you have your Bibles, you might want to follow along here. And so, again, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Literally, book of genealogy is just biblos genese. And so the, the word we, we use in English, genesis, that's, that's the root of genealogy, right? So it's beginning. It talks about beginning. And uh, the study, uh, genealogy, is just two words, genesis, logos, right? It's a rational, reasonable study of, gen of, of beginnings. That's what a genealogy is. And so you look back to the beginning. Um, and there's a couple of things here about this genealogy. Uh, first of all, it, it starts off by identifying Jesus Christ as the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why is that important? Well, Matthew was Jewish. He was a Jewish tax collector. And as we've often said to the years, each of the Gospels has a primary audience. Matthew's Gospel is the most Jewish of the four Gospels. He's writing to his own people, trying to bring good news to those that were still um, uh, in the realm of Jewish faith and understanding. And so David and Abraham were pretty big names. If you, as a Jewish person, if you heard, first of all, that this is a genealogy of someone that was the son of David, the son of Abraham, you, you'd, oh wow, I better listen, you know. If nothing else, it made you nostalgic for Father Abraham, for King David. So to a Jewish person, this is, this is an attention getter here. Um, second of all, uh, it's, it, it, it is a, um, a statement of, of two promises. Uh, King David, if you look back at uh, 2 Samuel um, verse seven, uh, or chapter 7, verse 16, it says that one of David, King David's descendants would be on the throne forever. So this is a statement that that promise to David is going to come true. Son of Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 12. What was the promise to Abraham? That, you, that your family, your family, Abraham, you know, through the Jewish Hebrew people, would then be a blessing to everyone, to all the nations. And it's interesting that right at the beginning, at the very first verse of Matthew's gospel parallels the last verse of Matthew's gospel. So he's saying, when, when they hear the son of Abraham, uh, the blessing to Abraham would be that everyone, not just Jews, that, that the good news is for everyone, 
that ever lives. That includes people at Trinity Baptist Church on December 3rd. How does Matthew's gospel close? Chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. So it's bookend. Verse 1, verse 19, 20 of chapter 28. The beginning of Matthew, the end of Matthew is all about the, the, the gift of God to everyone, not just Jewish people. Um, other thing that I think is kind of interesting about this genealogy is that um, Jewish people today, if you have friends that are uh, Jewish, and our friend Rabbi Gary that was with us a few weeks ago, he mentioned this, I, I know, in the Sunday school hour, that it's very difficult for Jewish people today, uh, the records of pretty well, you know, some of them can kind of trace their, their lineage, but uh, the, the strict uh, identification and tribal memory, and we hear about the, the 10 lost tribes and all that. It's difficult for Jewish people today to know exactly uh, who was on their tree a couple thousand years ago. But in the first century, when Jesus came to earth, this was still very common. And so the world that, that Matthew wrote in, the world that Jesus lived in, the records were still very, very uh, important, very exact. In fact, uh, in the first century, just maybe 50 years after Jesus' uh, resurrection and, uh, and ascension, uh, the emperor of Rome was a man named Domitian. Some of you heard about Domitian, 81 to 96 AD. Uh, the first major persecution of Christians came under Domitian. And one, and one of the things that Domitian did was, because the records were so exact for Jewish people in the first century, he uh, was able to look at those records and everyone that he found that was related to King David were executed. Male, uh, men that, were, that could prove that, they, that in their family tree that they could trace back to King David. He killed them. That was one of the first, pers not just the Christians, but also Jews. Uh, there is an account that comes to us outside of the Bible, but through a valid historical account, there were two Jewish men that were uh, brought before the tribunal. They were threatened. They, they said, well, you, you know, you're part of King David's family tree. And they, they did this. They held out their hands. And it saved their life. You know what was on their hands? Calluses. They were just poor dirt farmers. And the tribunal looked at them and said, well, okay, you're related to King David, but you're just poor farmers, so you're no threat to the emperor of Rome. We'll, we'll, we'll set you free. Weird, huh? How, how those little things happen in history. But this was, this was the world that Jesus came into. And, um, and this, this genealogy, it also allowed Jewish people, you know, kind of determine their access to the temple, to worship in the temple based on who is in your family tree. And it, and it became very stratified and and frankly, that's one of the reasons, if you jump way ahead to the crucifixion of Christ, what, what was one of the things that happened on, on Friday, on Good Friday? When, when Christ died on the cross, um, it was reported that in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, the most limited access in the temple, what took place? Rip, the curtain that divided, that only the high priest could go in, torn in two. And symbolically that means, oh, now everyone has access to God, not just based on who is in your family tree. And, and that includes us. You and I are here today because of what happened on Good Friday, the rip in the curtain that we have now access, regardless who's in our family tree. So a little bit about the origin. How about the membership of the family tree? Um, is it, we're not going to go verse to verse. I know some people kind of sneer at this. because If you have the old King James Bible, you're probably familiar with the begats. You know, it, uh, instead of the son of, so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. Old English word begat. And uh, uh, we're not going to look at everyone here. But what you do find in these 17 verses, it's divided in thirds, right? So there's 14 generations from Abraham to David. Then there's... Um, uh, 14 generations between David, the deportation to Babylon, 
and then from deportation to Babylon um, to the birth of Jesus Christ, 14. So three sets of 14. Why is that important? It's a memory aid. I don't know what you do to remember names. How, uh, don't raise your hand. Uh, but uh, uh, some of you are probably better than others at remembering names. Do you, why do you remember names? Well, maybe you have a system. Um, this is very systematic, and this was very, very common. One of the reasons that, um, that this was set up this way, 14, 14, 14, was because, again, we don't do this in our, our world, but in uh, particularly the first century, in Jewish, in, in Hebrew language, letters had a numerical value in the Hebrew alphabet. And so one of the reasons that Matthew uh, sets this up in three groups of 14, it, it, it's linked to King David. Because if you take David, how, what is David in Hebrew? It's just three Hebrew words. It's a dalet, vav, dalet. And if you take those three letters in Hebrew, that spells David in English, Dalit equals four, Vav equals six, Dalit equals four. Four plus six plus four equals 14. And that's how they remembered it. It was easy to remember because it was linked to King. All they had to do was think of King David. How many, how many numbers are in King David's name? 14, oh. Makes sense, right? Real, just simple. And if we do that, you have systems. Jews had systems back then as well. Second thing about this, all these names, like 42 names here. Uh, most Jewish genealogies, and you'll see another, if you look at the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, there's an, uh, he also has a genealogy. But the, the, the genealogy in Luke starts with Jesus Christ, works all the way back to Adam. The genealogy in Matthew starts with Abraham and works forward to Jesus. Both are accurate, both are, you know, uh, Luke's writing for non-Jews, Matthew's writing primarily to Jews. But most of the time, Jewish people, when they set up a genealogy, their family tree, uh, this is very peculiar, Matthew 1, because um, out of these 42 names, Five of them are women. That's a shock because most of the time it was just male. So num the, the number one, the usual criteria for a genealogy, well, well, there were three things. It was patriarchal, it was racial, and it was moral. Now let's take each one of those and see why this is so peculiar in, in these 17 verses. First of all, it's not patriarchal. There are five women here. That just was not done. That's a shock to, a, to a, a Jewish Hebrew reader. It starts off, Abraham, David, oh, okay, we better listen up. And then you, go, you start reading this and go, wait a minute, what are all these women doing here? What are they all doing here? So that's number one. It's, usually it's patriarchal, there's five. And the other thing is, when you look at these five women, if a Jewish person was even willing to, to accept that women could be included in a genealogy, who, who would they expect? The great matriarchs of Jewish history, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, right? But Sarah, Rebecca, Leah aren't mentioned here. Who is mentioned here? That leads us to the second peculiarity. Not only are, are women mentioned, but four of the five aren't Jewish. Tamar, Canaanite, Rahab, Canaanite, Ruth, Moabite. And if you were a Moabite, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3, Moabites, because they weren't willing to um, help the, the, the Israelites when they came out of Egypt, they, they, ha, they, were, they were told in Deuteronomy 23, 3, you, you will be cursed for 10 generations if you're a Moabite. And Ruth was a Moabite. 
uh, number four, Bathsheba. Bathsheba was born Jewish, but who'd she marry? Uriah. Uriah was a Hittite. And so her marriage to Uriah, basically she gave up her Jewishness and became a Hittite. Um, and then you have Mary, right? Uh, number five, and she's obviously Jewish. Um, so that's the second peculiarity, that four of the five aren't Jewish. Thirdly, and this is maybe the most devastating to a, to a person in the first century, this would be such a jolt, <laughs> such a massive jolt. And frankly, um, when, when you, even in our generation, this might jolt you as well, but before we're done here in a few minutes, I think you'll see the grace of God involved in this. Um, because we said uh, normal genealogies were patriarchal, racial, but they were also uh, moral. You only put people in your family tree that were upstanding citizens. And uh, we got a big problem here because of the five women, uh, Tamar disguised herself as a prostitute, had sex with her father-in-law and produced two twins. Okay? Uh, Rahab didn't have to disguise herself. She was a prostitute. <laughs> and she enabled the, uh, uh, in Jericho, you know, you know that story, um, hid the spies and Israel was able to, to come into the promised land. Bathsheba, you know, it's a little more problematic, but you know, King David, it, she entered into an adulterous affair with King David and the baby that was born uh, died and her husband was killed. So she was respond. Well, you might, and David obviously carries the primary responsibility for that. But you might ask the question, and this is delicate because we don't know for sure, but why was she bathing, taking a bath in public, <laughs> you know, where the king could see her? And second of all, she didn't say no to his advances. Now, there's a, there's a power differential there. So if the king of Israel tells, and you're a young woman, even if you're married, I want to have sex with you, you know, the, the weight is on King David more than it is her. But at the same time, does she, does she have any responsibility in this? You know, maybe. Um, so that's a little more problematic. But Tamar and Rahab, that's a big shot. Rahab and, and Tamar here. But let's go to the male side of the family tree. A uh, bunch of kings mentioned here. Rehoboam, Abijah, Jehoram, Manasseh. Wicked, 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 wicked. <laughs> horrible, horrible people. They're in Jesus' family tree. Uh, Ma Manasseh repented. He was in prison, so he, you know, he, had a, he ended well. Um, on the other hand, you had Asa, Jehoshaphat. They were considered good kings, so some wicked, some good. But then David himself, uh, not exactly a paragon of virtue, right? Look at all the things that David did, you know, had, had the leader of his army killed, set a, Uriah up to be, he was a murderer. <laughs> David was guilty of murder in the worst possible way, guilty of adultery, had a bunch of kids that were just out of control. Um, and yet David was described as a man after God's own heart. Uh, look at David's son Solomon, who was the, the product of his adulterous affair and then marriage to uh, Bathsheba. Bathsheba was Solomon's mother. You know, look at the life of Solomon. Not exactly a paragon of virtue. Um, go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham was a liar set his own wife up, um, lied about his relationship with his wife. You might even call him a coward. Why did he lie? Because he was afraid. Um, Judah, you know, the first, the, the line of Judah that came, uh, the oldest of Jacob's son, you know, he sold his own brother into slavery. So the point is, when you look at the family, the members of Jesus' family tree, the nicest thing you could say about this is he comes from mixed stock. <laughs> he really does. I mean, uh, not all of, there was no great pattern of righteousness that just came down through the centuries. It was, uh, it was just a mix. 
Um, his mom and dad were righteous, Mary and Joseph, but uh, his ancestors, uh, interesting, right? Which leads us to our third and our, fi our final point here. What's the future of the family tree? Um, first of all, when you, and we're, again, you can read this on your own. We're not even going to uh, go down through all this. But all these names, nine of these people that are listed in, in Jesus' genealogy, they're never mentioned again. They're, they're, they lived, and they had children, and they, they passed on the lineage, but you never hear about them again. And, and isn't that also true of your family tree? There, there are people in your family tree that were... Um, uh, 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 had reputations either for goodness or badness, but there are a lot of people in your family tree, mine too, that were just kind of here, lived, died, and you don't really know much about them, right? That's, that's just normal. That's a normal family. So in one sense, this is a pretty normal family tree. On the other hand, this is almost a criminal lineup. <laughs> when you go down through this, um, if, if you just picked out the, 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 the prominent people, you had murderers, you had cheats, you had cowards, you had liars, you had adulterers, all in the family tree. And, and so then what do you, what's the future? If, if you have all that in your family, is there a future? Well, later in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, uh, Jesus makes this comment that really is kind of the, the definition of not only his family tree, but his ancestors, but really it's the Christmas message, right? He says, I came not to save the righteous, but to save who? Sinners. And uh, he had plenty of them in his tree, and that's why he came. Um, but here's the second piece, and this is good news for you, good news for me. When you, have, when you begin to look at your ancestors and you see this mixed bag like, like Jesus had, and I'm sure it's in your family too, it's certainly in mine, um, you can break that chain. You don't have to pass that on. And, and God through Christ gives you um, the mind, the heart, uh, the ability to, if you're not happy with, with your ancestors, break the chain. It's possible. Uh, you see that everywhere we go, everywhere we go. Two more points and then we'll be done. Uh, John, uh, Julianne, if you would put up this last uh, slide. I don't know if you've, ever, if you've thought about this, but um, the letter N, if your name's Nancy, you'll love this, but, um, or Noel, or um, anybody, who, whose name, you got any N's in here? I, I'm blanking. Nobody's name with, starts with an N at Trinity Baptist. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, in the same way that Jewish people took um, David's name and it was, a, it was an aid to their memory so they could remember their ancestors, here's a little something as we begin this Christmas season. Maybe this will be helpful to you, not only for your own family, but just when you think about the life of Jesus, think of the letter N. Very simple, you know, it's, a, it's an easy memory aid. This is not only the pattern in Jesus' life, but it could be the pattern in, in yours too. Just think of this, this, this. Think of upward, downward, upward. Isn't that, isn't that the life of Christ? Upward is Christmas. It's... Uh, God comes to earth, Emmanuel, that we're going to sing, uh, that we sang. Um, so there's an upward, Christmas is really an upward season. It's, whoa, God came to earth. Things are looking up, right? But from Christmas to Easter, it's downward. And uh, over the next few months, uh, as you think about the life of Jesus, it's not going this way, it's going this way right? And it bottoms out in the grave, and then on Easter Sunday morning, goes back up. And 
the, la the, the last vertical on the letter N has no end. At we, you know, the screen was too short, so we couldn't extend it, but ex <laughs> extend, it, extend it for eternity, right? Everything's going this way now. But in order to go this way, you had to go this way first, right? Death only comes because life is offered. But you got to die first, Jesus, and then it goes this way. Um, here's the last thing I want to say. Um, I conducted a funeral yesterday, and um, I would say... Um, you know, I've probably done, I, I can't remember, about 150 funerals over the years. And all over the world, different places around the world for different age groups. Every now and then, you, you do a funeral, and you're struck by how powerful one life can be. The funeral yesterday was for a young woman, uh, young to me. She was 33 years old. And uh, she had spent the last... 12 years of her life in horrible, horrible, uh, from a human standpoint, horrible pain, so much pain, so much pain. And uh, uh, somewhere in that, she came to an understanding of this, this, and this, the letter N. She uh, came to an understanding of the good news of, of God in Christ. And um, the funeral yesterday, um, they all vary, you know, I, I did a funeral one time in a bitter cold day on the East Coast for a man. Um, it, it was the low point of all, of all the funerals I've ever done. This, this was the saddest. Uh, I buried a man who um, only had one person come to his funeral on a bitter cold, devastate, it just, exacerbated the atmosphere. Yesterday was one of the happiest funerals I've ever, if, if that was the saddest, yesterday was one of the happiest. This church was so jam-packed. <laughs> there were people standing, at, you couldn't get in. They were lining the, the back, there were people standing outside. For a 33-year-old woman who'd been sick for 12 years, her life was so powerful. She had such an impact. It was also the longest funeral I've ever done <laughs> because I only, I only had a few m minutes to talk at the end, which is probably good, but there were so many people, just person after person after person, kept coming up talking about the impact of her life on them. Uh, all age groups, little children, all the way up to senior citizens, middle-aged people. And... But here's what struck me about that. Uh, maybe more than any one thing that, um, that occurred yesterday, uh, the way that church um, was configured, that all during the service, uh, they just had a chair where I was sitting. Um, I kept looking up, I, the, the people that were speaking were here, then I kept looking, right in front of me, carved into wood in this panel, right in front, and you just couldn't take your eyes off of it. it. It was just carved in the wood. I am the resurrection and the life, dash Jesus. So that was all. Then in the last few moments when it was my chance to talk, I turned this way and I looked up. And on the wall, uh, as you walked out of that church, right over the door, was painted right over the archway of this wall, less we forget, lest we forget. And uh, knowing we were going to do, it's the first Sunday of the month, and knowing we're going to do um, communion on the first Sunday here at Trinity, I thought, boy, it, doesn't life just sometimes um, come full circle, even when you don't expect it? Uh, isn't that what, th what this table's all about? I am the resurrection and the life. You know, you get excited because life goes this way, you get devastated because life goes this way, and then you realize life goes this way for eternity. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life. And as Jesus said, do this as often as you eat this cup, bread, drink this cup in remembrance of me. 
how full circle to walk out and see over the doorway, lest we forget. Lest we forget. So the last thing I want to say today, friends, is that if, if life has kind of gone this way and now it's going on this way for you, it's possible for it to go this way for all eternity. But here's a little important thing to remember. Heaven requires reservations. Heaven requires reservations. Let's sing.